afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for your patience. Um, I'm going to introduce now Paul Lamb. And Paul is a former builder in his early 60s. He was involved in a car accident in 1990 and now is almost completely paralyzed. He can speak and move his head and retain some motion in his right arm. Due to some painkillers he had been prescribed and took for some time, he has suffered short-term memory loss, and this is quite considerable. He was able to wean himself off these painkillers, but it does mean he is now in even more pain. This will be the first time he has spoken about his situation in front of such a large audience. And I'd like you now to welcome Paul Lamb and his carer. Thank you. that microphone? Yes, you do. Closer. Is that any better? No, it's not close enough. Is that any better? Yes. Right. I know, it's very close now. Is that okay for you? Yes. Yeah. Um, can I start by saying it's a pleasure being here. I've not done anything like this before, so I've been a bag of nerves, so I'm hoping that's calmed down. <laughs> what do we do from here? <laughs> I think what we'll do is I'll ask you questions and then you can respond. And if anything interferes that you can't remember anything, I'll just prompt you. All right. Okay, Paul. What was your life like before your accident? Yeah. I had my own business. I was a builder. Um, ferociously independent. I've been since I was 19 when I had my first business. Um, I've always been active. So outside of the business, I once bought four greyhound puppies and I spent over a year raising them and training them to run the greyhound tracks. And out of the four, I produced two champions. <laughs> that was a long time ago, back in 1980, 1979, that kind of time. Can you tell us something about your accident? What happened to you in 1990? Yeah, it was from a car crash. I went from being able-bodied to paralyzed. Um, and apart from that, the moment which I can throw over a joystick, that's it. My left shoulder's dislocated. The bad attempt to put the arm back in its joint about three or four times but then it just hurts more when it pops out I don't have any muscle growth anymore so it doesn't have the ability to stitch back in or I have to be careful because every time I bump it just hurts more and more but um, did I go do I go? Well, I know the first 12 months, it was, I didn't go. I didn't. And it took some work on it. And the thing that changed it with me was, one night I'm in bed, and because we, the house hasn't been adapted at this stage, I'm looking at my wife and two children, and they look sad and it just tickled to me then. Obviously the circumstances 
It is sad. And what I managed to do is this one morning the nurses come to give me all my drugs that I was on and I just literally says, I don't want to take any more. My head had become zombified. I was sleeping more hours than I was awake and I just wanted to function again as something normal, you know. And after going five days of cold turkey, I got rid of all the medication. Um, but only to find that I'm in a lot of pain. And so I've got this decision to make. Do I make myself a lot better in the pain area? It never gets rid of it. But how do I make myself any better? I've lost myself now. Sorry. What, what I wanted to ask you is, what's your, what is your day-to-day -day life like now? Um, how you spend your days, what it's like living with pain and, and having constant care? Yeah. Well, every day is different. And it depends on the pain level. Um, which I, to my care, is anybody who know me. I work on a scale level and the best I've ever been from day one back in 1990 is pain at about a level two. That's, That's on a scale of one to ten. Yeah. Level two being an annoying pain from a toothache, that kind of pain. And it took quite a few years, but I genuinely have managed that kind of pain. I can sort of self deal with it. I say, well, nobody's going to repair it. So what do you do? You know, you get on or you give up. And I'm always trying. So, you know, that's what I'm doing now. I'm, I'm trying mm -hmm. and I always will. Sounds like you've had to develop great forbearance. Yeah. Whether that's come through time. Yeah. yeah. Um, and how have your friends and family adjusted to your new situation? Have they found it difficult? Yeah. It took them a long time to get used to mm. the poor that was and the poor that is. And all I've ever tried to do is maintain the poor that was. Um, people who know me, they don't have to say anything to me because they know if I'm suffering or if I'm having a good day. Right. And I understand you don't want an assisted death immediately, but they'd like the right to an assisted death. That's correct. That's what, what I've always wanted. And can you explain why that's so important to you? Because I know when it comes to the last days of my life, that this country hopefully will look after me. Um, and ideally, let me have a death in the privacy and comfort of my own home with family and friends that I want around me. And I don't want to go to a strange country that I don't know, they don't know me. And that's what, to me, it's almost like I'm getting shoved out of the back door because I'm some kind of, I don't know, embarrassment to the country, to the people that can't deal with it. And you feel that's what it would, would appear to be if, say, you went to Switzerland? That, that you yeah. feel that you've been pushed aside? I think we'd like to mm. show me out of sight. Uh, well, it, so far, I started this in 2013. And it just seems to me that the country doesn't care. They don't. It, I, when, when you say the country, do you think that in terms of the general public or the um, way Parliament works? Parliament. Right. Because that's been said from the beginning that until Parliament gets involved, nothing's going to change 
the matter how many times it goes back to the courts of this country until Parliament get involved. That's that's the that's what I've been told and heard over the last four years. But I plan on being a thorn in the side. I really do. Yeah. And this to me. I've never been on home plan since the girls come in here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And you know, strange things. Since I've been here, it's been a bit of an adventure. Well, coming to Cambridge for the conference. Usually it is when I go to work. <laughs> Tell me, Paul, why do you think we don't have legal assisted dying yet? What do you think people's objections are? Objections? The two main ones that were thrown around well, that are there. Um, you've got from religious people, based on it's against God or whatever you worship, to actually take your own life. And the second one is the slippery slope, where the fear that horrible people might end the deaths of their families for financial gain and nothing more. But, you know, I respect that there's religious people, I respect anybody, but Seemingly, this country is not respecting what I'm asking for, which fundamentally, I don't get it, there's 80% of this country in favour of it. So how can the minority keep this like it's almost a laughing matter of what we're asking for? But I'm prepared to sit in the face of anybody and have a, just a conversation to hear them, how they can sit there and justify that I should go through God knows what might be years of pain and suffering just because they're religious or because they feel about the slippery slope. So when you're put in that position with those with those arguments, whether it be religious people or the, the fear of what would be opening up this slippery slope, how do you counter it, counter those arguments? What do you say to them? I don't know if you just listen to people like myself. I've, I've lost myself, sorry about that question. No so is it by actually talking about your first-hand experience and trying to excite their compassion then, to make them realise what your life is like? Before going down that road, there's a word that I can, for some reason, cope with, you know, the sympathy factor. Right. I can't stand people, I'm not saying against a person, mm -hmm. but I've never been after the sympathy vote, and I never will be after it. I just want the law changing. Yeah. That's it. But in terms of how you communicate that to them, is it actually trying to make them open up and understand what it's really like for you? Yes. Right. Yeah. Um, so can you tell us about your previous work on the case with Tony and Jane Nicholson and the, the sort of sequence of steps that happened? Yeah. Well, I was approached after the death of Tony. But as it happened, I'd been watching his case in the High Court in this country where he was asking for the right to die at the time of his choosing in the comfort of his own home. Well, he lost. And I was unfortunate, well, fortunate that I saw his face which is on the TV, it's on YouTube, 
you can find it at Rucker Sunday, who is totally and utterly beaten. And I sort of, I, I zoned into that, and I listened to it, and I just thought, this guy's had, had a business in this country. He spent all his life in this country. And the one fundamental thing that means, it's the last choice anybody makes, is your death. And Tony had what they call Hopkins syndrome. So he found it hard to communicate after he's done with the machine. Um, and I just saw him fail. And I actually said to my friends, carers around me, I said, he's not going the last one. I, I just saw a broken man. And when he died, it was strange because I joined an organisation called Fate, Friends at the End, previous to this. Um, sorry, I've just lost myself again. I suppose what, what I'm really interested in that, I mean, it sounds like it must be quite a very painful thing to watch his disappointment and pain. Yeah. And I wonder how it also was for you how you actually felt when your case was unsuccessful? Well, in the high court, I wasn't surprised because from the moment of getting in the car and listening, which I was, I kept hearing this odd word coming about from one of the judges, the sympathy for the tone in myself. And I've been hearing it about three or four times. First, I was in a lot of pain anyway, but I just couldn't sit there any longer at that moment, so I turned around to come out, and unfortunately, I had a thought in my head at the time, and it was that. When you see a judge, you have to blow your head off if you're leaving the car, and I couldn't. So I just got out of the way and I told the solicitor why I'd come out like that. And I said, I, you know what? They said to me, yeah, but Paul, you should be careful because you could have had your locked up and taken it out yourselves. <laughs> and, and to this day, I said to anybody who knows me, why didn't I push for that? They have been jailing my friend here, my carer, you know, and how the heck would they cope with me? Like we just found with the taxi coming here. I've, I've come late horizontal in a disabled taxi, which all Frankie here could do was <laughs> laugh at me. <laughs> and yesterday was fun and games. We, we got to our hotel. Shattered with tired, we've got a five hour drive and bumped the square up and down, but we're still here. And. Sorry, can you I just interject. Paul's, Paul's travelled here from Leeds. Yes, yeah, sorry. Um, so it's quite a journey to get here. Um, and you've had quite, yeah, quite a remarkable night in the hotel, yeah. um, which we thought would be um, quite sympathetic and understanding of people's needs. Um, but they, they sort of failed you, really, didn't they? <laughs> Tell us, tell us about your night. <laughs> the night. Well, we get in, and I've been previously told that it was going to be a, a double sized bed. And because obviously it's got the turns, etc., etc. And when we got there, it looked like a double bed. <laughs> and we were shattered by it, and it was. And so my two team of carers started to take me to get me into the bed somewhere, which means putting a sling around me and hoisting me up and going a lot of tracking and then lowered a bit like you'd let, uh, pull out an engine of a car. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then <laughs> lowered back into the bed and the motorist put me near the middle of the bed. And from the moment of getting it on, I thought, 
this bed sinking. <laughs> and there's Frankie here. And Jackie, my other carer. And for some reason, they found it hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, what's the funny? And I started laughing even more. It was hysterics. And go on, Frankie, I'm going to put this to you now. Why are we laughing? Well, the bed, the bed was two single beds put together. Ah. And it came apart. Ah, but it wasn't so much that as. It wasn't just two single beds put together. The bed, to get my hoist underneath, they'd raised it about six inches. And the way they'd raised it was peculiar. I only wish we'd got a picture of it, but it was almost like a cat funnel. And it had been turned upside down. And there's eight of them, the one on one single bed, one on the other, that had been pushed together. And it was to be like laughing and nobody knew what to do. So I said, well, you're going to have to stop the ice for a minute, let's think about this. <laughs> and then, I, well, how did we end up with the fact that we had to get me out of that bed into a shower chair? <laughs> oh, and that down the bed. And then down the passageway, <laughs> starters. He was covered up. He was covered up. Well, we were wrong, out, it wasn't that covered up. <laughs> My butt was sticking out of the back for starters. <laughs> okay. Yeah, you'll remember this day. <laughs> So, um, Paul had a bit of a disturbed night, so did Frankie, and the second carer. Um, and then they had a, a, a rather epic journey here now. But, so this is part, part of the, the joy and an interest in life as new, yeah. new experiences come to you. Um, I want to take you back to um, the, the House of Commons case in 2015, when they rejected the assisted dying bill. Um, how, how did that make you feel, and how do you think it means going forward? Um, well, the more we go forward, more people are getting to know what's going on by talk. And all we're seeming to do, I mean, since 2013 to where we are now, the percentage of people for and against it's just been going up all the time. And I keep seeing it on the news, people that are religious even, that are coming back to say, you know what, we don't need this law. Because seemingly, the only time people really get involved is if something happens to somebody in their family or friends and they're having to go through it and realise what laws and regulations and I'm just trying to I've got a memory that will always stick in my head a Sunday I got to know who for the last three years of his life it, it, it was just turned from one side to the other every two hours and I remember me and this other chap we kept saying we're laughing because it was funny we knew it by the sound of this little portable TV on a roller trolley wheeling from one side of the bed to the other. <laughs> so the funny side, we just found that funny. But in the three years we were watching nurses, the friends and family crying because he was screaming out for this ability to end his life. And nobody listened to him. No, that's not right. Nurses, that people were listening but unable to do anything for him. And to go through year, three years of pain, just from one side to the other, saying to people, I've had enough. My family and friends were happy. They're all happy with doing this. So why can't I? Yeah, because it does sound like that it's, it's a sort of contradiction that we care 
And that's why we're turning to someone every two hours so they don't get pressure sores. Yeah. And yet, that, if that is all someone's existence is, it's, it's grossly unfair. So what, from what, what I hear is it's not, it's not just from your own perspective. You can see how other people are suffering too in terms of what they're having to endure. And that's, that's why it's really important. I can honestly say, say it's something that needs to change. Mm. Not just for me, for what I believe to be thousands of other people yeah. who are, in one way or another, perhaps on the brink of saying they can't cope anymore. And this law to be changed, all it will do is give people peace of mind. That's all. I've always said this, that to me to have this peace of mind would be like having millions in the bank that I think then you wouldn't have to worry about your money problems. Well, with this coming into law, there'll be a lot of people that are going through it at the moment. And I know we'll appreciate it. Mm. But a lot of people haven't got the fight in them or the ability to get to somewhere like here. Whereas I have, and I'm going to put myself where it takes. So that even if I help a half of a percent, it's helping them. I've already made it my, one of my missions in life now to resolve this. And as far as I'm concerned, I'm going to get my winning head on here because I don't like losing. No, and I don't think you should. One last question. From what you've said, I think you've already told us this, but I want to sort of get confirmation. From when you had your accident in 1990 to where we are now in 2017, th do you think there has been a quantum shift of opinion and that we, we might actually be, be optimistic that this will change? Well, the shift of opinion is the proof's there in the percentage, how it keeps going up and we're in the, we're in the 80s now. And I'm absolutely certain the time I've been showing my face here, there, and everywhere. You know, if I don't knock it up at a half percent or a percent, then I'll feel like I've failed. But I'm trying to bring the old Paul back. The Paul that's been battered over the years. The Paul that did not like losing at anything. And, you know, I even was able to, and I was proud to. My two children went with me. My two children went out. My aunt said, I've got a, a boy and a girl. It's only two, a year and a bit between them. And I was able to deliver what I actually was good at. Very good. And that's running. And the first year when my son, uh, it was at his second and modern school, and his first part there, he was in a 200 metre uh, relay and he set off in front and came in last. And, and I was sat with my wife and not long after this race he came racing down the field with his friends all trying to catch up. He got in the car and, and he was crying his eyes out. And about two or three weeks later I just said to him, how do you feel if you kick butt next year? And he thought I was joking with him. And he went, I can't remember. And he says, have some trust in me. The following year, and this is absolutely true, it's there, he thrashed the 800 metre uh, record, school record by 30 seconds. You know, yeah. And he went on, he's it, 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 been the least cross country champ for a couple of years. He went on to be West Yorkshire champ, Yorkshire champ. And then unfortunately, the same thing happened to my lad that happened to me in that life took a turn. In my lad's case, this turn was girls. <laughs> and, and going out with the boys and after beer drinking, get up to uh, uh, some right little funny tricks. Like, uh, maybe I shouldn't say this, but 
in the morning, I get up and I find my the weather over here at Roadworks outside. The, the the light that flashes on and off and the odd corn. And I'm like, what, what's, what's this? So I'm not going to have that. I think I told words with my son. It was turned out to be. He got the record in Bradford for being the youngest chartered accountant to pass all his exams. And now he's a partner in the business. So I class that as something I'll take to the grave that both my wife and myself we raised two beautiful. And I've now got four grandchildren. And the race. Well, it sounds like they all give you an immense feeling of pride as well, which is wonderful. Absolutely. Paul, thank you very much. Did you want to field any questions? Did you want to answer people's questions or no, do you want to leave it there? I don't mind. If I can't answer them, talk to yourselves. Yeah. <laughs> We started late, but I think we've got a, a few minutes to um, take some questions. Yes, gentlemen here. Richie, uh, just in front of you, Richie. Oh, you have a microphone. Who has a microphone? I heard very loud voice anyway, I think. Can people hear me? Yes. Okay. <laughs> uh, Don't start telling me off, though. <laughs> no, it's not a point. It's not so much a question as just to say. Uh, you had my uh, immense respect. My grandfather died in excruciating pain over six months. And I don't, when my time comes, want to be in that situation. So really, I just want to thank you, not just for campaigning on your behalf, but for campaigning on behalf of, of me and people like me that want that right. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much for that. But from day one, when I took this on, I wasn't taking it on just for me. I was genuinely taking it on for what I am now as well. I'm doing it for people who aren't, maybe not as strong, and I'm just another person that, when I'm not here, if the door changes lot, then there'll be somebody else coming up, and somebody else, and somebody else. So in my head now, I'm going to get the winning, you know. I'm determined that it's going to change this law. I really am. And I'm just going to do everything and anything I can to make that happen. Maybe they should change me to number 10, I don't know. But, <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, any other questions? Good, because I can't see one enough. Thank you. Nice to see Richie getting exercise. Yeah, we do. <laughs> Richie's so overweight as well, he needs to learn. <laughs> uh, Paul, th thank you so much for your honesty and frankness today. It's quite um, awe-inspiring. I just wondered if you'd uh, ever had discussions with Dignity in Dying who um, say quite clearly that they support assisted dying for the terminally ill, but not for the incurably suffering. Um, and if, either have you had discussions with them, and if so, how have you addressed that difference that they see? If you haven't had discussions with them, how do you confront that when you're talking to people about the assisted dying issue? Because clearly in the UK, the proposals for legislation only address the terminally ill, not the incurably suffering. Yeah, yeah. I mean... I think personally, personally straight away, such as you know, Conway with this case, that one's answering ASAP because otherwise it's just another Tony Nicholson about to happen again. And I don't think we should even allow that possibility. So something needs to happen straight away with the Tony, uh, sorry, with this Conway, Mr. Conway. But with myself, you know, I've been suffering pain for 27 years this July, and at times it gets so bad, the only thing I know is to knock me out. And one of the things I take, and I can take quite a bit of, is something that they used to knock out 
potted, and that's ketamine. Well, sometimes I can take probably what ten times what they give a horse, and it still doesn't knock me out. So probably says something about my stubbornness. <laughs> but genuinely, as um, medicines are coming on, people like myself are lasting a lot more time because of new medicines, new ways of helping this, that and the other. But in a lot of ways, to me it's enhancing me, oh, it's another year that I've got of pain and suffering. What did I do to deserve this? And, <laughs> you know, yeah, we as a country, you can see it. A dog lying down in the street looking like it needs to help. And we've, I think this country has got more chance of helping dogs. Because we do. You take a dog to the vet if you think, wow, I'm sick of seeing my dog suffering so much. Especially if the vet says, and there's nothing we can do to maintain any quality of life. So we say, okay, as sad as it is, heartbreaking. I've got a two year old chihuahua now that. I swear if I only had enough money for feeding of one, I'd rather he got it than me, just because I love him so much. Now I've lost track of it, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, does that say enough on that one? I'm sorry. I, I think it does. You, is that one thing's up there? Yeah? Um, I sat in the balcony earlier, and I think there's a mic, a standing mic up there. I don't know if anyone wants to ask me a question up there because you're sort of a bit left out up there. No? Okay, we've probably got time for one more question, if anyone down here wants to ask anything. Yes, thank you. Can I pause, as I'm sure everybody else does, uh, add my admiration for what you're doing, and uh, particularly... Sorry, sorry, can you speak up Sorry, a bit? yet my admiration for your coming here today. As you said, you were worried about being here. I think the last 40 minutes or so has been an eye-opener for many of us, and, and I'm sure we all admire you for, for being here today. You mentioned the religious objection, Christian objection, to assisted dying just now. And in fact, within the Christian movement in this country, there's a conflict. Uh, and there is uh, an academic theologian called Paul Wood, who I've heard speak a couple of times. And he talks about, he supports assisted dying, by the way. Uh, and one of the reasons he gives is that Christians should see dying as no more than a junction on the way to the next life. So, you know, Christians just don't have a constant or a, 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 a regular real thought about it. There's so much conflict between them. So, Andrew, do you think that's um, I, 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 worth I, I, exploiting? I'm really sorry, I, I missed out on that. Oh, did you not catch it? No. Um, Andrew was talking about the fact that not all Christians think the same. So there's conflict even within the, the Christian faith, um, that some, some Christians will say that death is only a juncture anyway um, to, to, to this other world. Um, do you, I don't know if you know that's some, something you've ever used in an argument back to. You know. No, I've not, but with anybody who's religious, I've got, I've got absolute respect for. I've got respect for all people's choices, and, and that's basically all I'm asking for choice of somebody who is disabled and not getting that because I believe is it not like it, it's not a crime to commit suicide is it? Well in fact I think mental health there's been a quite a big fight about the semantics there to actually get rid of the word commit yeah. so that people take their lives or that they create yeah. the verb suicide because it's not illegal as you say but to take your life so if it's not illegal it's like my legal right is being abused here, and, and I'll fight for it to get where I have got equal choice, even with such a choice. Because to me, I just want to be happy, and anything I do, I want to do it for good, not for bad. I want to die proud, as I've been all my life. I am a very, very stubborn person, which um, people get to know and realise that. That's why... I see Frankie nodding <laughs> next to him. <laughs> well, it's like the friend I had from Fate, who I was 
a Dr. Libby Wilson. I don't know if anybody is familiar with the name. Maybe not. No? Say, say the name again, Paul. I didn't catch it. Dr. Libby Wilson. Libby, Libby Wilson. Yeah. I don't know. No. Well, tell, us, tell us about Dr. Libby Wilson. As the lady I've always dealt with within um, fate, but unfortunately, uh, she lost her life. She's no longer with us. But um, now, what's the point I'm trying to get you on this one? Yeah, just about how I got into And we're well, talking about your your unrivaled persistence. Oh, <laughs> that's just my nature. <laughs> I'm sorry, I've got about my memory because no. it, it really is bothering me. Paul, you've, you've been amazing. Thank you so much for coming here today.